As we head down to Orlando in the bubble, Chris, did you go to both of these games? What was the situation uh, for you watching them personally uh, last night? Yeah, I was at uh, both of them last night. I mean, they're all it feels like all these days are blending together. But yeah, I was at the uh, the late game uh, Rockets and uh, and Thunder and uh, a wild finish. That's for sure. All, all these games, all these, the last two game sevens have been really good. Do you have access to replays inside of your venue where you're watching? So when there are huge controversies about calls at the end of the game, are you able to see them like television viewers are? Yeah, there's there's a, a big screen right behind us that shows the TV replay and another one right yeah. in front of us so we can see it. And it's funny, there's also the the base of the NBA's head of officiating sits right in front of us. We kind of we don't exactly, we don't talk to him, you know, right in that moment. We can kind of see his reaction as well. All right, so what did you think of the in-game scenarios, which obviously are stealing away almost all of the attention? Let's start with the end of the game again between the Heat and the Bucks. What happened? Did they get it right or wrong? I, I think by the letter of the law, they probably got it right. There will be a last two minutes report that comes out later on this afternoon that, that they'll clarify whether the calls are right or wrong. But – I do think the the eyeball test says they they got them right. Um, in the first play, you're you're not allowed to effectively invade a guy's landing spot. That's been a point of emphasis for the NBA for a couple of years now, because a lot of guys were. And I think Kawhi Leonard actually dealt with this injury a few years ago from something like this. You know, they don't want sprained ankles when guys right. come down. You're just not when allowed you step to step underneath a jump shooter. Exactly. So that that's the one. And the second one. I guess theoretically Giannis had a hand on him, so it was a foul. Either way, I think you got to swallow your whistle there, though. I don't yeah. think – I think in those situations, you can't be the reason that this game – or how this game was decided. So even though it's it's probably going to come out later where the NBA says, well, the referees are right, I don't think that that you make those calls in that moment. One of the things that the NBA gets a reputation for more than almost any other league is the makeup call. Do you think that yeah. the call would have been made on Giannis and send Jimmy Butler to the line with no time remaining if the call hadn't previously been made on the prior possession? Hey, it's a good question because it was the exact same referee that yeah. made that call. Um, and, you know, I, I question, and this happened a couple of times in the Rockets and Thunder game, I question when – when there's another referee that has better position, and there was in that moment, one staring right at that play, uh, I, I question why the far side referee makes that call. I mean, I, yeah. I think you've in that situation, if the referee baseline had made that call, you say, okay, this guy is quite literally staring at something five feet in front of him. But when the other referee is 20 feet away or more, it just uh, that doesn't sit right that, that he makes that call. So I think that's a... A fair question. I, I don't know if I believe – I think the makeup call was definitely around like 20 years ago. I mean, that was, you know, when you had some older referees um, from a different era. I think it was around – this one felt a little makeup call E, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, and, uh, and it turned out that way. Uh, we have two 2-0 series right now in the East, and I'm going to get to the West in a second. Um, and – you have the Heat up 2-0, and you also have the Celtics up 2-0. Will both of those teams, in your mind, win the series? I think they both win. How they win remains to be seen. I, mean, I think Toronto's mentally tough enough to bounce back from from a two-zip deficit. And one of the things I've been writing about for the last month is has been the impact of Kawhi Leonard still on these Raptors. Uh, you know, Kawhi's mental toughness – and his ability to shake off losses lingers with this team still. I mean, this is still a lot of the same players on that roster that won championship last year, and those players remember going down 0-2 to, to, to Milwaukee in the conference finals and shaking it off and winning that series. So I think the Raptors can, can shake off what Boston did to them in the first couple of games. I still think the Celtics are a nightmare matchup for them. They've got about four guys that can put 20-plus on you any, any given night, and that's just – it's not a great matchup. Plus, Pascal Siakam is having just a a bad restart. Not just a bad series, but a bad NBA restart, and that's a problem uh, for the Raptors. I, I'm not so sure about Milwaukee. I mean, you, it's another bad matchup with, with Miami, but Miami is just so much more mentally tough, I think, uh, than, than Milwaukee. And if, if you watch that game, you can see the imprint of coaching 
Like, I think Eric Spolster is having an incredible coaching series. I mean, he's what he's doing in that series, he's pushing all the right buttons, and it seems like Miami, for two games, has been a step ahead of Milwaukee, and I'm not sure that changes as this series progresses. So I think Toronto's got a better chance to win, but I think both these teams up two zip win the series. Let's go to the Western Conference. Let's go to the end of that game scenario last night. Um, first of all, what is Steven Adams doing on the court at all if they're not willing to throw into – I don't know if you saw it, like, watching yeah. live. I was like, oh, my God, I don't care what play you design. Steven Adams basically had his defender, who we had about a half a foot on, on his hip, and they were giving him a clear path to the basket. To me, there's an easy inbounds pa- pass there to a big man – and he's either going to get fouled or he's going to dunk. He may score and get fouled, in which case you could win the game, yet the uh, Thunder have to take a timeout. Then they end up inbounding the ball to him at the three-point line, going away from the bucket where he has absolutely no chance. What happened down the stretch? What did you see in this game? And what's the lasting significance of it? I mean, not great. Uh, not a great play call. Awful execution. And... You know, on that particular sequence that you're talking about, two major problems with it that you know that, that you have to, to remedy in those situations. One is the inbound bounds guy can't be a second year guard. Like he, no matter how good Shea Gilders Alexander is, you know you have to have a veteran player in that spot so he can kind of go like to use a football analogy to kind of go through his progressions. Like yeah. you, you've got to look and see that the initial uh, guy you're supposed to go to isn't there and then turn and look for, you know, Steven Adams in that spot. The other thing, I, you know, Adams didn't do a great job making himself available either. Like, you know, Adams yeah, right. kind of sort of stood there, you know, acting like a decoy. If he had just kind of bodied up, you know, uh, PJ Tucker and extended his arm and called for the ball, you might've had Gilgis Alexander notice him and make that pass uh, in that moment. But I mean, that was, that was bad because you're right. I mean, if you just lead uh, Adams enough, you're going to get uh, you're going to get on the ball. It's either going to be a dunk or a fo- or a foul. And I think there was enough time with 1.1 seconds on the clock for him to catch, gather, and dunk. And uh, and that was that was a blown play. And then to even, I mean, why inbound it to anybody at all? to throw the ball to him in that play. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how after Chris Paul had a triple double and led that team back in the fourth quarter. You have multiple chances to get him the ball at the end of the game and he doesn't touch it. I mean that 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 was a little bit crazy. You got to win, you know, live or die with with a Chris Paul jump shot and that's that was bad. My my, my bigger takeaway though, broader takeaway is that I mean that was you just saw the the Rockets franchise life flash before your eyes on that possession. I mean, they lose that game and, you know, half that team and maybe the coaching staff just not bothered to get on the plane coming back. Because I think you know Tillman Fertitta would have just let them all go at, at one point. I mean, it's uh, they, they quite literally salvaged the franchise, or at least the way it's currently constituted, uh, with that win last night. All right, so now we've got the Lakers and we've got the Clippers, who are favorites to win over the Nuggets and over the uh, over the Houston Rockets. Are either of them in danger? How would you assess this series or these series? Or are we just waiting for Lakers, Clippers in the Western Conference Finals? Yeah, I think they're both big favorites. I have no idea what the Rockets have left in the tank. I mean, you know, it's one thing. They don't have to travel, obviously, to, to play L.A. But, I mean, to go through a grueling series and have to turn around less than 48 hours later and play a game one against a team that's just been kind of, you know, sitting by the pool for the better part of the last week, I mean, that's – that's a tough one, and and the clash of styles will be really interesting. I mean, the Rockets, you know, their tallest guy might be like the fourth tallest guy of the Lakers, you know, out there. I mean, that's just how weird that situation is going to look when when those teams take the floor. So it's going to take you know some miraculous performances by James Harden and Russell Westbrook uh, for that team to pull off a win. I think the Clippers might have a little bit more trouble, but it's the same situation with the Rock with the uh, with the the Nuggets. Uh, you know, Jamal Murray was incredible in that first round series with Utah, but how much gas does he have left in the tank? You know, turning around less than 48 hours later. I mean, I, I was at the Nuggets practice yesterday, and they were openly grumbling about that. You know, that how the NBA is going to put them in a position where you know they play a game seven, and then two days later they're playing in game one. And I, I don't know, I don't know how much they have left, but they've. I think they've got more depth 
and they've got more overall talent than uh, than Houston does to maybe throw some things at the Clippers uh, that that could be a problem for them, especially in that front court with Nikola Jokic there. But I, I think you know it's I, I, it's pretty safe to say that those two, the Clippers and Lakers, are big favorites, and you know we'll have the you know proverbial hallway series down in Orlando in a couple of weeks. What would happen if the Eastern Conference? continues to roll like it is right now right we got two teams up 2-0 and let's say you ended up with a double sweep would they go yep. ahead and start the eastern conference finals or would they let those guys kill, cool their heels for potentially a week or so while they allow the western conference to catch up because you could end up let's say one of these western conference series goes six or seven games given the fact that they're starting later i mean you could have a situation where there's a week where the eastern conference doesn't have anything to do yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and I, I don't, I've asked sort of something similar. I haven't gotten a direct answer yet, but w- one thing I know about you know the NBA scheduling here is they want to get the hell out of here. And yeah. if, if they if they have an opportunity to start a series, I mean, look, Boston-Toronto is going into game three. We just had yeah. two game sevens and uh, just the last couple of days. So I, I think if both these teams, you know, take care of their business, there won't be any more than, than three or four days in between – uh, the start of their game one, so it could lead to a potential, you know, week plus sitting out before the finals. But I get the sense that uh, if there's an opportunity to get the ball moving here with with those two teams, the NBA is going to do it. Last question for you: Any lasting impact from the boycott on you're in the bubble down there? You think there's any chance that the season gets shut down again, or has that now been rectified at least for the remainder of this year? Yeah, I think it's been rectified for this year and. You know, you know, one of the things that several players have told me is that, you know, the things that they got from the NBA owners, specifically this this sort of coalition that they're putting together to address some player issues now and moving forward, uh, that was basically the the the, the stopgap here that prevents you know if something like this happens again, it, it's not going to stop the game because they've you know theoretically achieved what they want to achieve in, in getting some of those concessions from owners and. And they're able to. to, to, to this will. It, it won't affect the, the rest of the season if they decide to do it this way. I mean, I think I, I've often said I'm, and I've written this. So I mean, I, I'm not sure the owners are the right people to turn this situation. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily the owners' job to do everything that that a player wants you to do. But uh, I think the owners were kind of the bigger man in in some of these situations where they said, "All right, we we understand players want more. We have a little bit more we can give, and let's." Let's decide that we're going to give it. So the players got what what they asked for, and I think that no matter what happens in the next month or so, I, I don't think that we'll we'll see any kind of work stoppage again. Appreciate it, my man. Uh, we'll talk to you next week uh, and uh, enjoy your time in the bubble. How long? Much longer in the bubble? I am out on Sunday, so uh, oh, I this week. Happy to go. Yes. Oh well, congratulations. All right. Well, next yeah. time we talk, you'll be out of the bubble.